conference, just to let everyone into the room first before we start with the official program. Fantastic. I see we have about 27 participants on the call. So uh, it's good for me to, to start now so we don't uh, keep everyone waiting too long. Uh, good morning. Welcome to this webinar hosted by the Global Wind Energy Council as part of Africa Climate Week as one of the official uh, side events. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, and I look forward to unpacking wind power in Africa. I think the time um, for, it, for it has truly, truly come. My name is Wangari Mashiri. I'm the coordinator of Africa Wind Power, uh, which is an initiative by G and the, uh, Get Invest to increase the deployment and development of wind power across the continent. Today, we have an exciting panel ready for you. Um, and I cannot wait for you guys to hear um, what we have lined up in regard to um, unpacking wind power from every corner of the wind development um, sector or, or agenda. Uh, we have, and please uh, go to the next slide, Alex. We have a, uh, we'll have the speakers introduce themselves um, and then we'll go into a 30 minute panel discussion, uh, just unpacking a few of the, um, of the points and the key issues that are raised. Uh, please feel free to chat us at any point um, and I'll show you that in the next slide. But after that, we'll have a Q&A and then some closing remarks from each of the speakers. Uh, next slide, Alex, please. So if you would like um, to ask any questions or if anything comes to mind uh, as we're having the conversation, please do click the Q&A button um, just at the bottom of the screen as shown in that, uh, in that slide, uh, and we'll be able to, to see the questions and point them to the right speakers. Great. Um, now I would like to introduce the topic that we're talking uh, about today, uh, and it's wind power in Africa. Uh, Africa's technical wind power potential is enough to power the continent's entire energy demand 250 times over. A recent report by the IFC uh, states that they, we have 59,000 gigawatts of technical onshore and offshore wind potential, but Africa is only tapping 0.01% of its potential with just over seven gigawatts of uh, installed capacity on the continent. Building wind farms is uh, to utilize this resource will be important to bring um, investment onto the continent, create clean energy jobs, critical infrastructure, and help support thriving local economies in line with the sustainable development goals. The time for wind truly has come. Here to unpack this with me is a distinguished panel, and we're looking at it from all aspects of wind power development from the commercial side to the financing ecosystem, technical know-how, and finally, from a wind and overall wind industry uh, perspective. I'd like to welcome my panel members, and I would uh, like to ask them to each individually um, to introduce themselves. I'll start uh, with what uh, on my screen, the top right or top left. Greg, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Wangari and GWEG for, for the invite. So, I'm Greg Fanatou and I'm country manager uh, for energy systems in, in South Africa for DNV. So DNV is a, a large uh, multinational uh, technical advisory company and uh, I cover the services related to energy services, which relates to renewables, um, grids, and also now also oil and gas uh, services that we provide. So I've been 
active in wind energy for around 20 years and uh, started in, in Europe. And uh, for the last 10 years, I've been leading the office here in Cape Town and we cover uh, the, the entire African and also Middle Eastern uh, region for, for wind. So that's me. Great, thank you so much. Um, over to you, Richard. Uh, thanks, Mungari, and thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here. I'm Richard Abel, and I work in uh, Macquarie's uh, Green Investment Group. Macquarie is the largest uh, investor in infrastructure globally. I'm managing director of a fund called UK Climate Investments, capitalised by the UK government, and that fund invests in innovative green projects and platforms in sub-Saharan Africa and India. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, Marsha, over to you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you again, Longari and g for hosting this webinar this morning. My name is Marsha Grimbeck. I have been working in the renewable energy sector for the last 11 years, primarily as a developer of wind projects, but I also chair the board of the South African Wind Energy Association, and our mandate is to promote, advocate, and lobby for the growth of wind energy, both in South Africa and on the African continent. Thank you. Great. Last but not least, Jean-Pierre, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Ungari. Thank you, Jiwek, uh, for good morning, all of you. So my name is uh, Jean-Pierre Sanchez. I'm a business development director for Africa in uh, Siemens Camesa. So we are a wind turbine, uh, wind turbine manufacturer uh, with, uh, I would say, uh, currently around uh, uh, half of those uh, seven gigas installed so far in, in, in Africa. So we, we, we try to have a, a big presence on the, on the continent. I've been working for the company for uh, for 18 years, so I'm related to the to the wind uh, business, and uh, since 2005, more or less, with uh, projects in Africa, first uh, constructing them and uh, selling them, and uh, lately as a plant manager of a blade factory in uh, in Morocco. So thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much. And um, having seen just the, the breadth that we have here in terms of the depth of, of knowledge across wind power, I, I'm really curious to know why there is not more um, assets, wind turbines on the ground in Africa. I think there is a massive investment appetite uh, for both pr private sector and multi, multi financial institutions, but there's not, um, they're not investable projects, they're not bankable projects on the ground. There's lack of seed capital um, for early stage Stage developers. How do you think we can get um, more wind turbines on the ground? How do we think we can get more projects to get to, to the stage where um, wind, wind, or the projects are considered bankable? I think I'll start with, uh, with Richard. Um, so I think the, first, the most, the evidence suggests or shows indeed that um, having repeatable at scale programs um, run by procuring authorities, so a, a series of uh, reverse auction um, where, where you sort of discover the price through people bidding, you know, to to uh, to get a contract um, to uh, for for renewable um, energy plants um, is actually the way to do it. Um, the, the sort of largest scale in, in one we see in South Africa, the REAP program, which is well known, um, you know, has delivered in that in that respect. Um, and what you, why why is that? Well, because it's quite hard for a developer or indeed a financier or indeed the lawyers who need to support the process of investment to go chasing after singleton projects that are a bit uncertain whether they're going to happen. Is there going to be another one after? So you put a lot of investment into sort of getting geared up for the first one. What, where are you going to have a lot, where there's a lot more success and will attract more bidders, which in turn will actually be, you know, a good story for, consumers and taxpayers, because it'll ensure a competitive cost of capital and pricing of the projects. It's where you've got a program. It's got a plan, it's got, and it will have a repeat program. So people can see they're gonna be bidding for things, they'll, they'll obviously not win every bid, but they'll win enough that it makes it worthwhile investing in the process. And maybe the only other thing I would add is that um, you also need the sort of full um, financing ecosystem to be there. So you need, developers need um, off takers. Uh, so once they've developed a project and it's up and running, then the more natural long-term holders of um, wind projects, um, like, like other infrastructure, 
typically pension funds and other institutional funds and their managers can offtake those to the more long-term natural owners. Um, and that's one of the reasons UKCI is cornerstone first of a kind, um, so-called yield co. So it's like it just buys stakes in operating uh, renewable energy plants. Got a lot of wind in that first portfolio called Revigo Africa Energy Limited, because you need that sort of part of the financing ecosystem there as well, that developers have confidence they're going to have a ready market to you know, make their returns by uh, selling on the projects in due course. Fantastic. And um, Jean-Pierre, I want to go over to you and ask you, um, what, in your opinion, what, what is going to make these projects bankable? Um, do you agree with Richard or do you have a different perspective from the, from the commercial side? No, no. I mean, I, I, I agree. Uh, well, according, according to, the, to, to the feedback we receive from our, uh, from our clients, at the end of the day, uh, those that are uh, dealing with these uh, issues of uh, financing for the project, I would say that uh, two aspects. The uh, first is, uh, as has been mentioned by, by Richard, uh, we need the bankable PPAs, uh, which is not always the case. And they, in some countries, they... Uh, it uh, failed to uh, to start with the with the wind sector because the the problems with the bankability of the of the PPAs and I would say as well uh, PPAs that are adapted to, to the wind sector because otherwise it makes things uh, much more much more difficult to uh, to to progress and on the other hand uh, well of course investors need a, need a security need guarantees for the tariffs to be paid over the 20 25 years uh, sometimes by off takers uh, national utilities that sometimes are on difficult uh, financial uh, situations so uh, I mean, either sovereign guarantees, put call options. I mean, of course, uh, developers need uh, some kind of, uh, of security to, to, to go ahead with that. But uh, I would mention that there is something even before those two questions, which is uh, also uh, you need to give access to those developers, to those markets, which means that you have to open the, uh, the generation sector to, to private investors, which is not the case in all the countries in, in, in Africa. So, I mean, put in place a, a legal frame to, to allow them in. Uh, because from a point of view, I think that uh, the, um, the government probably now should be focusing more in investing on the transmission lines rather than on the, on the generation, because uh, private developers have demonstrated in Africa that are able to, to do it at a very, very competitive price. So uh, I think uh, from my point of view, this might be the, the, main, the main barriers. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Um, and Greg, uh, Jean-Pierre has mentioned something about the transmission lines. Um, I, I worked a little bit in the wind industry in Australia, and the, the, the issue there was that we're gold plating the um, grid, you know, we're upgrading it to a point where it seems like it's gold plated, uh, rather than um, having, you know, what, we, what is just needed to evacuate the, the power. Is that what um, is happening in Africa? Or are we so behind in our grid infrastructure that we do need to bring it to a, a level that is, is enables us to be able to evacuate this wind into the, into the grid? Yeah, I think the, um, Africa is, is sort of a different, in a different, um, has different issues. Um, I think the main issue being the fact that large parts of Africa are not electrified yet. So there's basically a lack of infrastructure uh, to start with. Um, Australia has similar issues in that it's such a large um, country uh, that, that it, you have the grid infrastructure linking different areas together over very long distances and, and Africa would be the same. I think um, so. In general, it's 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 the lack of infrastructure that that is the issue at the moment. And uh, in order to to be able to utilize um, good resources in certain regions, what would work very well is to connect together the grids from various countries and different regions in within Africa. And I think that's been a focus of many different uh, organizations. And I think that is the key really to unlocking um, a lot of potential in, in Africa. Um, so these would be essentially sort of power corridors connecting 
the sort of south to the east and the west and the central and the north. So these sort of uh, power pools um, and connecting these together will, will allow you to, to be able to um, tap into the, the really great wind resource we have um, in Africa and, and be able to, to wield the power to different, different areas. And I think what it also then enables is, is for the low cost of this generation and obviously the fact that it's green, uh, it, then it will allow um, the, the economies to, to scale up um, and, and to, uh, because I mean, essentially Africa is in its infancy stage and it's, in, it's going to become much more industrialized over time. And so there is massive potential for growth and massive potential for growth in electricity as well. So I think that's that's the key on, on the grid side. Great, um, and Masha, I wanna uh, touch uh, touch on that, what he's uh, just spoken about in regard to um, connecting the different markets and making a bigger pool. Um, we, we do have regional power pools, but how do we then get um, a wider Africa-wide grid um, that we can now feed wind power from every corner of the continent. Uh, do you think that's a, that's possible? And uh, if so, what do we need to overcome to be able to do that? It's certainly possible, Wangari, but it requires um, a regulatory and political role to do so. Um, if we look at just uh, the South African power pool, um, Namibia, South Africa, uh, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, the grid infrastructure is already there. It is uh, now a regulatory willingness to enable us to transact across those grids. Um, so it is a combination of both um, actual physical grid infrastructure to be constructed, as well as uh, the willingness between governments of different countries in Africa to allow for that transmission of electricity. And I think one important fact we need to consider is that we need to align the grid rollout with the development of projects, because it's useful having a well-developed steady, well steady pipeline of bankable projects, but meaningless if we cannot extract that power and, and have that power utilized across the African continent. Um, you know, all the members of the panel have already indicated that Africa is growing. We're going to be electrifying Africa at a constant rate and an exponential rate between now and 2030 and certainly 2050. Um, and we cannot grow our economies without electricity and why not from renewable sources of electricity? So I think it, it's both political as well as infrastructure both. Fantastic. Um, we've actually received a, a question from the audience, um, from Alexander Klein, and he's asking, why is the lack of ele electrical infrastructure more an issue for wind projects compared to solar plants? Is it a question of scale? Um, it's, it, it definitely is. It's a question of scale and also the ability for solar to be more easily decentralized. So we can have what we would term an islanded system um, of solar, where we can look at let's say a little village in a rural part of Africa, we can have um, solar panels, we can have a battery storage system and supply to that community. But they're an isolated community and it's not an interconnected system. Um, wind, much better scale, utility scale, certainly in South Africa, we do nothing smaller than 140 megawatts at a time. That needs a significant amount of infrastructure, grid infrastructure to evacuate that amount of power. So it, it really is, a question of scale. Great, thank you. Would anyone else like to kind of touch on that as to why it's such a big issue for, for wind more than solar? Yeah, I mean, if, yeah, if you allow me, I would say that the, the, main, the main difference here is that, uh, well, it's more or less what uh, Masha had said uh, before. Uh, for, for solar, you can, uh, you can install it, let's say almost everywhere, close to the uh, consumption uh, areas. Uh, why uh, wind, you have to install it where you have wind. Therefore, you need a transmission lines to connect it to the consumption point. So, uh, well, that's, uh, that's one of the, of the, of the difference. And, and yeah, I see, we see it, it's, a, it's a barrier, of course, for, for, for getting more, more wind into the, uh, into the system. But, well, this is a reality that is uh, uh, everywhere around the world and, uh, well, we have been very successful around the world with the, the wind, and they see no reason why uh, in Africa cannot be the same. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, anyone else want to touch on that, or I can uh, kind of go to, on to the next question. I think from a from a scalability perspective, wind can also be integrated um, into these islanded systems. Um, 
but um, as, as Jean-Pierre was saying, you, you still need the resource. So I think that that's where the, the key comes in is that the, the, the windy areas are, tend to be where the people are not uh, because obviously people don't want to live where it's very windy unless you're in Cape Town, I guess. Uh, but uh, so, so I think that you can easily integrate uh, different sides of wind in, into isolated grids or even many grids or, um, uh, you know, so I think it's certainly feasible and it's, it's something that you see a lot on island systems in, in uh, areas that have good wind. Um, so I, I think you will see more wind going into uh, sort of isolated areas that do have, um, you know, that resource. Great, fantastic. And, and actually speaking of uh, where people are not, uh, we have received a question um, if uh, Africa is considering offshore wind. So uh, it'd be great maybe to touch on offshore wind and, and if we um, are looking at that on the continent. Anyone please feel free to go ahead. Yes, from Gariel, I'll take a stab at that one. Um, it is something that historically has not been considered around the African continent, uh, continent and that's purely a function of cost. Um, and as we've seen, there's been the initial entry of the wind industry into Africa, it has been cheaper to do the onshore wind farms and we don't have a lack of space. But as we look at the, the price of offshore wind coming down, technologies are improving, it is now a, a good consideration. We also you know, have the African coast, a lot of it is nature reserve and, and protected area, but we can look at deep sea. Um, and with floating um, offshore wind becoming more predominant, it certainly is becoming a viable option. So. You know, as we utilize um, onshore capabilities and we run out of um, areas of resource, offshore certainly, I would say, in the next 10 years is, is something that would be considered. And, and Jean-Pierre, I'd be interested to hear um, your take on that from an OEM perspective. But I think from a developer perspective, we really are um, looking at it as the next step of the wind industry in South Africa and definitely the rest of Africa. So I, I take the reference. So no, uh, completely, completely. Agree. I mean, so first of all, the uh, the wind resource in uh, in Africa is huge and is uh, is on top. So that's uh, the, the the onshore one. Okay. So it makes no sense uh, now uh, to look for the offshore when it's uh, more expensive. I mean, uh, to to produce electricity on uh, offshore is more expensive than onshore. You don't have main issues of uh, of land occupation in the in. Uh, in Africa, uh, wind turbines can easily coexist with uh, agricultural or farming uh, usage of the land. Uh, therefore, uh, no, I don't think uh, time for the uh, offshore has come yet to Africa. It will come, but uh, now you still have. Uh, I mean, you mentioned you mentioned before uh, the the huge potential, and uh, I mean, can mention that. Uh, uh, only on sites uh, with uh, more than 8.5 meters per second, which, uh, which is a huge, uh, you know, uh, potential of, uh, of wind, uh, you have more than 27,000 gigawatts to install in the continent. So, uh, well, first, let's start by that, and then we will see uh, if there is room for, uh, for offshore later. Yes, that's actually, uh, that's, that's fantastic. It's true. Let's start where we can first, um, and then, of course, look for, for other sources. Um, as we are talking to governments, and, and as governments come up with their policies, their renewable energy policies and master plans, we're seeing that a lot of them have a threshold of 10%, um, and this is just onshore, um, not even considering uh, what is offshore. How do you think we can convert this approach to help governments in Africa, really, and national utilities as well, really embrace wind power um, and make it a key part of their energy mix. So not just as a, as a complementary part, but the, the key part of, of their mix. Um, maybe I'll hand that to Richard. Um, so I think uh, the point of having a plan is, is, is important as people, as countries are looking at um, NDC plans for you know, decarbonization more generally in a COP26 and beyond context, um, that sort of, Spurs want to look at you know the energy mix across across the piece. I think um, look some of the points we made earlier around sort of grid capacity um, and you know con connectivity, whether you're part of a power pool or not. Um, I think is is some of what leads to some more sort of crude you know kind of numbers around 
you know, putting limits on uh, on things. So I think addressing some of the issues we talked about earlier lead to potentially greater potential for wind in um, a number of um, other governments. But I think, to be fair, I think it does need to be viewed in the overall renewable content, um, you know, of, of the electricity system and, and it's sort of part of a broader plan. And um, you, what you want is to be thinking creatively about all the, the different options there, particularly wind and solar combined with battery storage um, to make the best use of a particular country or, or group of countries if they're sufficiently interconnected um, use of wind as well as other technologies. Great. Um, and Greg, I want to ask you, so from a technical perspective, how do we um, explain to governments, how do we show governments that they really renewable energy should be at the forefront of your energy mix? I think um, the, best, the best way to demonstrate uh, or to communicate the value and the feasibility is to look at what's being done in, in developed countries. And uh, you know, as, as long as you have a fairly well interconnected system, you can connect huge amounts of, of uh, intermittent um, renewable energy. Um, and the key then obviously is just to balance it, but uh, certainly you can get up to penetration levels of more than 50% without too much uh, additional infrastructure required to balance that, that, that system. Um, and Africa generally has um, uh, has has hydro as well, which is also renewable and also can be used for for balancing, etc. And I think the if you look at the future, it, it's going towards smart grids. It's going towards integrating storage. It's going towards increasing your your renewable um, penetration, and all of those technologies and all of that um, uh, sort of implementation and proof of concept is going to be done in the developed countries. And then Africa can just essentially um, take all of those proved concepts and apply the same thing. And I think that's where the, Africa is in a, in a very strong position because the, the more sort of developed countries in Europe, et cetera, have, they've paid the dues of, of getting renewables to, to a point where they are low cost and proven. So essentially you, you're getting the best of both worlds. So you, you're starting from a low cost point uh, and you also have the experience from, from Europe and, and other countries. So I think it's, yeah, so 10% is is very, very conservative and you should be looking more above 50%, really. Great, um, and even when, when you speak about proved concepts, uh, one that is really becoming prominent and one of my uh, favorite topics to talk about uh, is green hydrogen. And we have received um, a question from the audience um, from Dr. Thomas Vrana, and he's asking, how does uh, green hydrogen and the demand from Europe for the same um, open new avenues to boost Africa's GDP? Wind, including offshore floating farms can play a huge role in this. Jean-Pierre, would you like to talk about that? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, yeah, it's clear that uh, green hydrogen is very trendy lately. So it's a, it's a, it's a topic that it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, I mean, it's taking a, a lot of uh, interest by, uh, by everybody. Uh, and I think, uh, yes, I think it's, uh, it's uh, something that uh, will, uh, will boost uh, the, uh, the, the renewables and it can be a good opportunity for, for countries uh, in, uh, in Africa to export it uh, towards uh, consumers like, uh, like in, in Europe or elsewhere. But uh, right now, the challenge is making a green hydrogen to be competitive against uh, gray hydrogen, which is not uh, yet the case from my point of view. Uh, there is still uh, some, some way to go. I think it's feasible. Uh, the only thing is that uh, we need uh, to improve uh, the efficiency of the electrolyzers. I think that's the, the, main, uh, the main step ahead. Uh, but of course, this, this requires investment and uh, uh, also uh, scale. 
uh, in order to, to, to be able to, to make it competitive, as in the same way as we've been talking so far about how uh, renewable energies have become uh, one of the most competitive sorts of energy. Uh, you need some time, you need investment, you, you, you need a scale. Uh, once we do this with, uh, with hydrogen, it will be possible. And uh, yeah, uh, commenting about uh, about uh, offshore, uh, we uh, in Siemens Gamesa, I mean, we we have a, we have a project which we are trying to uh, fit electrolyzers inside uh, offshore turbines in order to be producing. Let's say to have a wind farm offshore that instead of producing uh, electricity, electrons is producing hydrogen to be directly loaded into, into vessels. So, well, those are projects that are, uh, let's say, on, uh, on um, phases of implementation, on, on pilots, but uh, yes, it's a, it's a way ahead and it's uh, very exciting because I think it can, it can be a game changer for, for uh, uh, reaching the uh, net zero uh, uh, pollution, yeah. Yes, that is definitely true. I think that uh, green hydrogen is something that could be a, a great, um, I guess, I guess it open up the wind industry in Africa because we now have to, we're really limited by policy, um, by PPAs and, and all that. And if we can find an alternative way to use this energy, then maybe there could still be more developments of wind, wind farms in the, mean, in the meantime. Um, Marsha, I wanna come now to South Africa and because they're the, the, the most uh, developed wind market in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and so I want want to know from you, right now uh, South Africa has a steady pipeline of wind projects in the coming decade, which is fantastic to see. Um, so what are some of the lessons that um, you've learned um, and what some of the lessons other African countries can learn from, um, from the scale of wind that, that you guys already are um, implementing on the ground? Well, Mary, it's wonderful to say that, yes, we're celebrating 10 years of wind industry in South Africa, but um, just listening to your previous question, um, I'd say we still haven't done enough. If we look at, the, we, we are the most advanced on the continent, but we could have done so much more. And going back to what Richard alluded to right at the start of the webinar is, you know, we need that constant procurement pipeline. And if you don't have a consistent off-taker, um, we in South Africa have seen the decimating effects of stop-start procurement. Um, you know, it, it does affect local manufacturing, it affects the local job creation. So you definitely need to not just attract the investment and to grow the industry, but to take it to the next step where you can deploy and deploy at scale and continuously so. Um, we need to have that consistent pipeline. Also, if we go back to just the previous question you had on master plans and how do we um, ensure that the energy mix um, becomes more um, renewables friendly and certainly wind friendly, we need to consistently use our associations. And associations are always a combination of um, OEMs, developers, financiers. Certainly with the South African Wind Energy Association, we have all of those components. We need to be a voice at the table when policy is being discussed. We need to be engaging with our international counterparts to leverage their lessons learned. And we need to be consistently advocating and lobbying, highlighting not just that wind energy is now you know, cheaper to produce than traditional coal-fired. Um, and that is outside of the benefits uh, in terms of you know, reaching our climate change objectives. I think what we also need to be mindful of is what we've mentioned for, um, earlier on is developing at the same pace as our grid infrastructures being rolled out so that we don't have um, a pipeline of well-developed projects. We don't have a procurement round and we've seen now there was a seven year hiatus between rounds four and five. Um, and then you have a heavily oversubscribed round. It's also difficult for developers to continue um, you know, maintaining fully permitted projects. And I think if we go back to the basics of developing these projects, it's always to bear in mind that um, regional local development standards might not meet international finance standards. It's always important for developers to go back to, when we talk about bankable projects, what makes project bankable? Ensure that when you're looking at the development of your project, that you're meeting international finance standards, because um, if you're not, participating in a, a government auction, um, but you're looking at the private 
tender market or private PPA market, you still need to finance. You still need to be able to construct this. And these were valuable lessons learned in, in the South African context. Um, going to the green hydrogen economy, it's a wonderful opportunity for South Africa now. Being the most advanced in the continent, we're sort of wanting to be the guinea pigs again in Africa, if we can put it that way, to sort of look at, um, and exactly what Jean-Pierre was saying, we, there are many pilot projects, we now need to do them at scale. We are immensely excited about the European H2 Global Auction, where South Africa is one of um, the participants in that auction program looking to produce um, green hydrogen at scale. And again, yes, we are first entrance into the market, so there is a the cost of production that, that is a factor now, but hopefully, you know, five, 10 years to come, we would have seen a similar trajectory as playing renewables. And hopefully by then other countries such as Kenya would have ramped up their wind production, would be ready to now leverage of the lessons learned in, in South Africa again. Great, thank you, Masha. And I think that's, uh, that you've touched on quite a number of points um, that have been uh, fantastic. Um, I wanna go back to the bankability of PPAs because this is something that um, really racks my mind. As an African, if the power is cheaper, isn't it better? Isn't that all it, that is needed? Um, but from what I'm getting from this, this is not it. Um, maybe Richard, we can come back to you. Um, what does, uh, and I think uh, Jean-Pierre also touched on it before, he said, we need bankable PPAs that are adapted to the wind sector. What does he mean by that? What, what do we mean by adapted to the wind sector? Well, I think there's, there's some technical features around the, the nature of sort of wind production and variability that need to be taken into account. Um, and but, but I, but I, the, the fundamentals of bank bills from a, from a, from a financing sort of perspective is that there is, as Jean-Pierre also, also mentioned, um, you know, there is sufficient um, guarantee that the, the, the off taker, you know, can afford it. These are long dated projects, you know, with PPAs typically ranging 20, 25 years. And it, it, that's a long time. So need, you need some sort of, um, some, you need to, confidence that you'll be able to get that power on the on the contracted basis on which you bid for it. Um, and look, the most important things there are that there isn't retrades on the, the that people don't, the, the off taker doesn't seek to renegotiate the pricing with without um, without it being a genuinely consensual thing where, you know, there can be trade-offs, you know, that if, um, at times, but it mustn't just be cutting because it looks suddenly got cheaper um, now or ch cheaper at a later date or cheaper in a neighboring a neighboring state that, that's key and um, paying on time is really important as well and continuing to pay even when things are difficult and the South African program's got a good, very good record in that respect so you know that's something that de developers financiers look at um, when they're thinking about new um, you know investing in, in, in new programs. So uh, fundamentally, these are quite boring, predictable things, but that's what infrastructure renewable uh, financial investors are looking for. They're looking for stability, predictability, repeatability. And um, those boring things are what, you know, helps lower the, uh, continue to lower the costs in the sector for um, the ultimate users. Yeah, great. Um, and it's true, yeah, the more boring a project is, uh, the, the more easy it is for a financier to, to finance it. Uh, but Greg, I want to ask you, the South African market has been anything but boring recently. It's, uh, it's been quite, there's been a lot going on. Uh, so maybe you can also touch on other lessons learned in terms of um, what has happened uh, or what we can, other African countries can learn from South Africa uh, in regard to developing wind power. Yeah, so I think there's sort of three three key aspects when you, you're looking to develop projects. Um, so obviously you've already decided that there's, you know, you, you're developing, developing the project for a specific business case. Um, but the three sort of technical areas that you look at is obviously your grid connection. Uh, the Because obviously your power needs to go somewhere. Um, and the resource and then environmental and social. So those are the three sort of key aspects that you need to look at when you, you're developing a project. So from, a, from the resource being key, uh, you, you need to have a good idea of where it's windy. And I think international agencies, et cetera, have, have done a very good job at uh, 
providing what's called a wind map and that that provides uh, sort of down to a fairly uh, good granular granularity uh, you know how windy is it in any particular place um, and then you you look for the windier spots um, and then uh, you then need to measure the wind so it's then important to spend some some money and uh, and get good quality instrumentation um, and reliable measurements. Um, so this is where wind sort of differs from from solar in that you need at least a year of measurement and 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 usually you would need more if if you don't really understand how the wind has been in that particular area for a long time. So where where Africa sort of uh, is is lagging a little bit compared to sort of more developed markets is they don't have a lot of reliable uh, historical wind measurements, uh, um, even in South Africa. And it's also very diverse wind um, from different drivers. So it's it's important to, to try and get an understanding of the resource. And, and the only way you can do that is through measurements over time. Um, and then uh, obviously the grid connection is, is key. So you need to understand where you're going to connect. Um, obviously you need to be close to where the grid is uh, and the grid needs to be strong enough to be able to uh, absorb your power. Um, so that's sort of a, a key aspect of when you're looking to develop. And I think that's where in South Africa now we're starting to see some constraint on the network, um, which is, which has a massive impact on people that are developing projects because you have obviously gone and you've spent money to develop these projects and then there's no grid. So that's all money wasted or at least deferred until some point in, in the future when you can reinforce that network. And, and then I think the, the other key aspect is on the environmental and social side. For wind, the key is birds and bats and doing those studies takes time uh, and is, is probably what I would say that one of the key studies you need to do for, for wind farms. Um, obviously, you, you don't want to build wind farms um, where there uh, are migrating birds, where there are endangered birds, uh, and, and also bats are um, quite prevalent in, in many parts of Africa. So you need to be uh, make sure you get a, a reputable um, expert to, to study that for you. And there's uh, what's, what's happened is, is the, the market has developed over time, the technical expertise to, to um, detect uh, the birds and the bats in your region have, have improved significantly. So you can get, um, you know, if, you, if you're willing to spend the money, you can get really good high quality information, which then obviously makes the project bankable. Um, and then from a social aspect, you obviously need to think about if you're going to be building um, a large project in a remote area, you're going to be bringing in a large workforce into potentially um, you know, fairly small communities. And it can have big impacts on those communities. But the positive side is it can also really boost those economies. So you get lots of uh, local business, uh, which can be created and then can actually continue afterwards into the operational phase. So I'd say those are the sort of key lessons learned that uh, in the South African market. Um, yeah, so those are the three key key aspects you need to concentrate on. Um, would anyone else, or, or Jean-Pierre or Richard, like to touch on the lessons learned? Um, I do know you have some experience as well developing in South Africa. Uh, so for any anyone else, um, any other African country looking to learn some lessons from that, would you have any any feedback? Well, I think um, the main, from my point of view, the main lesson learned could be that, uh, and I think uh, Mercer talk about it, uh, refer to, to South Africa, is that uh, Continuity is very important. I mean, uh, it's important to, to to launch a project, okay, and to start with uh, with wind, with renewables in general. But if you uh, really want to to create something that has a, a meaning, you need a, you need continuity. Uh, countries are, are looking uh, very often, and that's uh, that's that's fair about how to, uh, to create uh, jobs related to this uh, kind of industries. 
uh, and it's possible and it's a, a look of a lot of opportunities here but of course you need continuity. You, you, you cannot be launching projects for two, three years and then stop for five. Because then, I mean, you, you have examples uh, in, the, in the continents of, of companies. Uh, I take the example of uh, the, 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 the tower manufacturing companies. There are tower manufacturing companies that have gone bankrupt in, in, in some countries because suddenly the activities stop. Uh, so, and uh, well, it has been the case in South Africa, but also elsewhere. I mean, uh, uh, the, you, you have, a, you know, uh, it has been a lot of effort by, uh, by, by stakeholders in order to be able to, to, to build an infrastructure that is able to, to not, not just to create jobs, but also to create skills in the country that then disappear. So uh, I think uh, that's very, very important. It's, it's continuity. You, you need, you, you, need uh, you, you, you have to put a, a, a plan and try to keep it. Otherwise, I mean, uh, investors cannot, uh, cannot uh, you know, uh, rely on that, uh, invest and really have a plan on the long term where really you are creating jobs and you are training people. Which is, and, and, when I, and when I talk about also training people, and I, I, I saw a question about, uh, about the issues of uh, skills in the, in, the, in the continent, I mean, there is, there is a, a lot of opportunities, no, no just uh, for, uh, for manufacturing, which, which is the first thing that people think about. You know, you, you, you go for, uh, for renewables and then you think about manufacturing. Fair enough. But it's not just that. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities also. Uh, Greg was mentioning before about uh, environmental studies. I mean, people able to do uh, locally those environmental studies. People able to, uh, to look for the, the wind resource, to be able to study the wind resource and to make uh, the, the reports on that. So this is possible to do it locally. Uh, technicians for O&M, specialized lawyers for, for, for this type of contracts and on renewables, uh, people uh, expert on finance for developing the projects. All of, all of this is possible to do it locally, but if you don't have a continuity, you cannot train the people uh, and, uh, and those people cannot get their job. Yes, that's actually, that's very fantastic. And I, I, I love that you've touched on that, uh, Jean-Marc, uh, Jean-Pierre, because I feel like there is definitely a lot of opportunity that people don't see. People think, oh, straight to, to go in a, and manufacture turbines or um, whatever it is. Um, I want to now look beyond the South African case and um, to the more nascent energy, uh, wind energy markets across Africa. Uh, having spoken about what uh, Jean-Pierre has touched on, that there's so much opportunity, not in manufacturing, but in every other element of, um, of wind power production, how do we accept accelerate these actions to, to make sure that there's a further uptake of wind power across the continent. What do we, what actions are needed to be taken? Anyone can go ahead. Go ahead. Well, Gary, I think I, I might step in there. We need to collaborate. I think if we work in isolated pockets to drive the, the acceleration of wind industry into Africa, we, we won't be as effective. We need to have that constant conversations between ourselves as developers, between the wind turbine suppliers. You have a need to sell your product and to install your product. We want to harness the wind. We want to harness clean energy production, but we need to be influencing government, as we mentioned before, to change their regulatory policy. So it is almost a public-private partnership, a conversation that needs to be held and consistently as much as we want that consistent rollout. And we also need to be encouraging governments to relook those master plans more regularly. It's wonderful having a master plan or um, an integrated resource plan as we have in South Africa, but it becomes stagnant after five years. We should be looking at two year reviews. How much have we deployed? What has been the impact of that deployment? Where can we improve? Um, looking back at the lessons learned, uh, rather than saying, oh, government will do its thing and we'll see where the market takes us. Let's be those drivers of change in the market if we want to see the deployment happen at a faster rate. Great, um, I'd like to hear from everyone. What, what actions do you think we need to do to have to accelerate this process? Anyone else feel free to go ahead. Yeah. I think another aspect of the public-private sort of partnership that um, uh, Mesk, Mesk correctly um, highlights is, you know, at the sort of international level, you know, where there's a role for um, uh, m for multilateral institutions in sort of working with um, with governments to help create the the fiscal framework that um, which could happen at the state level or an, an off-taker level. 
um, or even a municipal level potentially, um, to you know enable sort of bankable payment structures to be put in place. Um, but also all the other sort of um, factors, um, Macquarie's involved in the Climate Finance Leadership Initiative and some of the recent work we've done there with, with DFIs and others is to sort of highlight some of the, con the conditions that private sector uh, participants look for. And, you know, that goes all the way through to the wider aspects of bankability that Greg was correctly highlighting there in terms of social and uh, env local environmental um, uh, standards and consent. Um, but, I, but I think it goes to, you know, ensuring that this, this sort of wall of, of money that's interested in investing in sustainable um, infrastructure um, and, and interested in investing in wind um, can see a sort of sustainable path within, you know, new jurisdictions for the deployment of, their, of the capital. And that goes to that sort of continuity that we've all been highlighting in, in procurement programs and, and sort of uh, regulatory permissions, but it, all, but it also goes to ensuring that what is being procured in that program is actually sustainable for that country. Because we can all, we've all seen examples where there's been a rush and actually what's happened is there's been over procurement in effect. So that, I mean, whether you could argue that it's not over procurement when you look at the energy needs in the medium to long term, but you end up with, you know, um, departments of finance at loggerheads with, you know, departments of energy. Um, and you end up with people being awarded PPAs and then they're left high and dry, having invested all that time and effort in sort of getting to that stage and you know, work on the sites, you know, millions of dollars typically. Um, and then left high and dry for often years. And that's a disaster, right? You want to make sure this thing is, the, the, the master plan is regularly reviewed and at the outset, is this stuff is being procured that there is agreement that this is sustainable within you know that particular sort of jurisdiction or authority from from all aspects including um you know the, the other pressures on on government or or or, or um uh, uh, national utility spending again just finally i'd say that in that context that's where sort of targeted you know financial support from uh, you know, the developed world um, can potentially be very helpful, you know, in sort of ensuring that some of these things can happen. Um, but it, it needs to be sustainable all the way around. That's absolutely correct. Um, and Greg, would you like to touch on this, um, on this point as well? Yeah, I guess the, one of the key changes that's happened over the last 10 years is the fact that renewables continue to, you know, the price continues to go down uh, significantly. And I think what is happening is that it, it's, it's making, um, it's make, making life difficult for, for, for governments or government entities to regulate, um, you know, their master plans because they're obviously changing. It's changing so quickly. And I think the big change now is, is in storage. And as that, becomes cheaper, it's gonna become viable for many entities to essentially produce their own power. So I think it's it's now getting to the point where they can't just sit back and, and block everything because people will just go and do it themselves. So I think we had quite an exciting point now where there is the potential for people to just go and do things and it's good, but um, working hand in hand with those types of projects, Will be more beneficial than trying to block them because it will just happen on its own otherwise. Um, so I think that Mercia mentioned it, the collaboration is, is important, but I think these uh, you know, various governments need to start thinking more strategically in, in how to partner with, with the new technologies. And, and I think a little bit less regulation would probably go a long way. And I think there's also potentially now the, the market for uh, private offtake. And I think that's where you can really get a lot of traction um, quite quickly. And so I think that's, that's where people should be spending some time and, and trying to grease the wheel, so to speak, and, and, and get those kinds of, of discussions going. 
Great, fantastic. I, I have, have a, a whole bunch more questions, uh, but we are now five minutes to the close of the webinar, which is, um, it's crazy how that's gone by so quickly. Um, I think I would like to ask each of the panelists to just close the one 30 second to one minute parting shot um, on, on their thoughts around scaling wind power in Africa. Uh, and then we can go on to kind of the, the close of the closing remarks. Thank you so much. So maybe I'll start with, with Marsha this time. Uh, Marsha, please go ahead and, and give a one minute closing remark. Thank you, Wangari. I think, you know, we're, we're at a, a point in Africa where I always like to think of it as being at the top of a roller coaster. Um, and it's an exciting ride ahead of us. Let's look at accelerating government policies. Let's make this happen. And I think what's key here is to um, really empower governments across Africa to not think in cycles of, of, of elections. Um, let's look at the longer term view. Let's look at where we are going to be in the next 5, 10, 15 years, as opposed to what happens when the new regime comes in over a five year period and we start from scratch. Let's have that continuity of policy to align with continuity of procurement and make Africa the great generator of wind energy and exporter of green hydrogen in the next 20 years that it has the potential to be. Um, we certainly have the resource. It's available to us. We have the land available to us. Um, we just need the willingness. And we, we, we certainly have that from the private sector. Um, we have the investment funding. Let's make it happen. Yes, for sure. Let's definitely make it happen. Now, Jean-Pierre, would you have one uh, last closing remark? Yeah, I think uh, we, we probably all, all, all go on the, on the same way. I mean, huge results in Africa competitive, I mean, renewables in general, wind in particular, renewables in, in general, very, uh, very competitive. There is complementarity uh, amongst the different uh, renewable energy. Uh, and uh, there is gonna be a, an increase of the demand of, uh, of energy. That's also, that's also clear. As uh, Marcia said, there's land availability. So I think all the, all the factors are, are there for, for success. And I think, uh, well, it has been mentioned already before. And uh, I think uh, one, one key element here, it's, uh, and, and, and probably for multilaterals and so on to, to, to be working on that, which is uh, invest in interconnections. I mean, the, the, the countries to be interconnected. Uh, this, is a, this is a way of being able to, to export your surplus uh, and to be able also to uh, to make your uh, your grid uh, firm, uh, there are examples. I mean, there are examples of uh, small countries in the in the continent where they are being able to uh, to export the surplus of electricity. I mean, I can mention Mauritania, for instance. Uh, they they install several wind farms, and now they are exporting uh, their their surplus to 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 other countries. They export it to 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 Mali, to Senegal, and so on. It, going to be the case of Djibouti uh, soon as well. So, I mean, it's possible, it's possible uh, uh, wind turbines are more and more adapted to, to, to work in a more aggressive environments in terms of, uh, of uh, weak uh, grids and so on. So let's take the opportunity. I mean, uh, I think it's, uh, it's the right moment. Fantastic. Um, Greg, over to you. Yeah, I guess the closing remark would be um, that that wind is proven. It's uh, it's been around for for a long time now, and Africa's at the point where uh, it it pays dividends to 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 take this this proven technology at a low price, and it can spur the economy. So essentially, it's a um, it's a way that they can remain competitive and, and scale up, uh, obviously, the industrialization of, of the continent. Fantastic. Um, and Richard, over to you. <laughs> I would echo that it's great news. It's a great problem to have that you need to revisit your master plan regularly because prices of these, um, uh, these technologies are falling so rapidly um, and, you know, have been proven um, in Africa, but also at lots of places around the world. And I think that um, if you look at one of the other big trends in Africa that we're going to, that we're already seeing and we're going to see is, is that of urbanization. Um, there is going to be a um, massive scope for um, clever interconnection and you know, grid connected, large scale utility uh, generation, in addition to different, uh, you know, more combination of more off-grid, many grid for, for very rural areas that are going to take longer. Um, you know, to 
just to be able to justify the subsidy required for, for full grid connection. So there's scope for both. There's, and, and wind power's got a massive part to play in that, in that um, powering of urbanization and greater um, clean industrialization uh, in Africa going forward, um, combined with that urbanization. So I think um, well, there's some grounds for optimism uh, with those macro drivers. And uh, if we let's work, let's work together to try and hard, to try and take advantage of them. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the distinguished panel members. Really appreciate your time um, today and the fantastic conversation. I think I still had three more questions in the Q&A box. So I think we should continue this conversation. Um, we will be launching Africa Wind Power on the 30th of uh, September. Uh, so we can go to the next slide, Alex. And so if we, if you are keen to continue this conversation, please join us. Uh, you can scan the QR code on your page, on your screens right now, uh, which will send you to the registration link, and then we can uh, continue this conversation on there. Thank you also for all the participants who joined us, all the attendees. Uh, we had uh, about 40 um, who are on there up until a few minutes, a few seconds ago. Uh, so we really appreciate everyone's feedback, everyone's questions, everyone's engagement, uh, and we look forward to continuing the conversation with African Wind Power um, and with GWEC uh, going forward. Thank you, everybody, and have a lovely day, wherever you are. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.